See, Michael, it was, re it was really fascinating how you can slice and dice things, and no matter how you see it, if you're a believer, you can find the Lord, and the Lord will find you in it, no matter what's going on. The green light is on, Charlie. Welcome to Grace Gospel Fellowship, everybody. Those of you who came out live in the studio audience, blessing to have you with us. And those of you tuning in at home in your PJs and your coffee or whatever, I'm glad you're with us. Charlie, let's start things off with a word of prayer. Get down to business. Thank you, Pastor John. It's dearest father, it's Abba father, and Avi, my father, we thank you as always that you love us and you have always loved us and we love you. And you have put us in a spiritual place called Goshen, where we no longer dwell in the land of good and evil, light and darkness, past and future, types and shadows. For Christ Jesus came to shed his blood at the cross and take all judgment unto himself for all the sins of all the world. And with his resurrection, Father, you gave us his righteousness, for he took away our sinfulness. And we who now walk in the Spirit know that it's Christ who leads us and guides us down every road we take, even the ones we call Emmaus. For he is walking beside us and lives inside of us. And we thank you for this, Father, in his precious name. Amen and amen. Amen. That really made me smile. That was such a good prayer, Charlie. Wow. Where else are you going to hear prayers like that? I hope you're glad you came this morning right there. That's a, that was worth the, the price of admission right there, Charlie. Thank you. Well, you can tell by the title of the message we're gonna, what we're going to talk about this morning. But it's not like you ever heard it before. So to get started, I want to read something that's familiar to a lot of you. Slow down, you're moving too fast. Some of you already know where I'm going. How many of you know where I'm going? Slow down, you're moving too fast. Oh, come on. Okay, I can hear it. So Charlie's into it. He knows. You got to make the morning last. Just kicking down the cobblestones, looking for fun and feeling groovy. Ba da 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 da, feeling groovy. We all know it. Know and love it. Hello, lamppost. What you doing? Or what you knowing? I've come to watch your flowers growing. Ain't you got no rhymes for me? Doing do do, feeling groovy. Ba da 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 da, feeling groovy. That's written. I have to read it. I can't sing it like that, you know. Uh, I got no deeds to do, no promises to keep. I'm dappled and drowsy and ready to sleep. Let the morning time drop its, all its petals on me. Life, I love you. All is groovy. Paul Simon from the 59th Street Bridge Song from our youth than one of those anthems that painted the backdrop of our youth. Here's another one. It's a beautiful morning. Ah, I think I'll go outside for a while and just smile. Who's that? The Rascals. I got a peaceful, easy feeling, and I know you won't let me down. The Eagles. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. I've got a beautiful feeling everything's going my way. Oklahoma, come on. Gordon McRae, Rodgers and Hammerstein. Well, those aren't just the only songs that sing about that stuff. How wonderful life is. And I'd have to say, not so fast. 
I think about how I was raised. I'm the oldest, firstborn, you know. And my mom, the picture she painted of life was all those songs, those lyrics. That's the way mom wanted us, me and Loie and Mary Jane, to live life, to enjoy life. We actually went to see all the musicals in the 50s as a family. All of them. You know, Oklahoma, Annie, Get Your Gun, South Pacific, My Fair Lady, on and on and on, all of them. And we had the records. So I had the record albums playing all the time, all that beautiful music that was really celebrating a, a great type of prosperity and a great, um, bountiful, rich life that was exciting and beautiful and the future was all rosy and it was just going to get brighter and brighter and brighter. That's the way my mom, that was a trajectory that was happening in her attitude and my dad's attitude and the music that we had in the house and the movies that we went to see and stuff like that. Mom had uh, scarlet fever when she was a girl, almost died. And she'd tell me at Christmas time that, you know, people would have the Christmas wreaths. We never had a Christmas wreath. And when we'd go get our tree and get the garland, I'd ask mom, let's get a wreath. And she never wanted to get a, a Christmas wreath because in the war, in the Second World War, they would put wreaths, black wreaths, on the doors where one of her friends was killed in the war. So all over Western Springs, there would be these wreaths on the doors. And she would save plastic bags and tinfoil and rubber bands and everything. And Dad, one of my first jobs when we moved into the new house, I'm four, um, down in the basement, uh, you could still smell the concrete smell of the fresh new house that they'd built. And my job is I had a, a big can of chase, an empty Chase and Sanborn can filled with nails that my dad had pulled out of boards in the alley where he grew up. They were bent nails, and my job was to straighten them out by pounding them on the concrete floor and putting them in another can. And there was, a, I mean, it took me months, you know, but that would be what I would do. Dad grew up in a, on the west side on Washington Street in a two-room apartment. His, his father had come over um, during the revolution in Czechoslovakia uh, against the communists and my grandmother when she was pregnant with my dad she fled to uh, Austria dad was born in Vienna his father is over here came in through Ellis Island and dad came over when he was about three and he had um, uh, uh, polio he had to have these braces on his legs and stuff when he was a kid um, they grew up in, in that, that apartment. had one light bulb. They put himself through medical school. Became a prominent psychiatrist in Freud's Institute. He was an only child. Um, and of course they lived through the Depression. That's saving the nails, saving the plastic, the tin foil and stuff like that. I just thought that was normal because I never had to go to the hardware store to buy nails or screws or anything. I had jars filled with all that stuff on the workbench. They did not have the life I love you all is groovy life. But they didn't want us to have their life. And it wasn't that they were, that we were ill prepared for reality. But their emphasis was let's have a positive resolve to this. Mom was as a girl, she was raised in a congregational church in Western Springs, but not a Bible reader, don't know, but she's, after dad died and she was a widow, she started going back to the church in Hinsdale, the Union Church, where Loie and I had gone when we were really little a few times, you know, like when we're five, or, you know, five years old, something we went for a summer to the Sunday school there. That was my first exposure to, to Jesus, to the miracles, you know, something special about this Jesus character when I'm a little boy. But you can't say that I had a religious background at all. 
And so I become an adolescent, and I, I start growing up, becoming more independent, and I'm hanging with my friends, and I get a little taste that things are not all that good in other people's homes. You know, somebody's also had a drinking problem, you know, so-and-so was whatever. You just realize life is not all that nice and pretty. And of course, when I became, uh, you know, I'm a musician, and so I played in rock and roll bands. And there's the dark side of rock and roll, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And um, the drugs was present, and there was friends of mine that died from overdoses and were heroin addicts and stuff like that. Uh, not the closest friends of mine, but these are acquaintances. You're in that scene, and that goes on, you know. And I remember telling my mom, oh, you know, so-and-so, yeah, he's addicted to something. And I'm trying to break it to her like she doesn't know how tough life is. And I could see that she was kind of like, I don't want to hear, I don't want to know that about you, that you're associated with people who are, you know. So it hurt her, and I, and I realized, don't, just don't talk to your mom about that stuff. But it was a little bit like she was Pollyanna-ish, you know, rose-colored glasses. We'll just look at the positive, and everything's really nice. It was the impression I got. But all those beautiful songs that I just cited about how wonderful life is, not so fast. It's not a Pollyanna-ish thing to look at the beautiful and appreciate the beautiful, wonderful things about the creation. But remember, we're not here to have a nice time. We're not here to have your best life now. Is the world one way or the other? Is it a mixture of both? Do we just have to take the good with the bad? Is that, how, is that the deal? Is that the way the cards are dealt to us? We're here to make a difference. We're here to be the light of the world. Because the world is a bad place. It's a terrible place to be. Who's saying that? The world is a bad place. Was it Badfinger? It's a, the world is a bad place. It's a terrible place. I remember before when I first heard that song, I'm going, finally, <laughs> somebody took the veil off and told it like it is. Now I realize when you're raising kids, you want, to insult, you want to keep their innocence as long as you can because the longer they can hold on to that innocence, the closer they are to Christ when they enter the world and they're going to remember that instead of falling right into the corruption and the darkness of the world. But the light came into the darkness. It didn't come into the, oh, what a beautiful morning. No. It's hostile against Christ here. So Jesus, Jesus comes to earth with the gospel. And we, we, th we hear about the gospel of the guy that was raised from the dead, the guy that was born from a virgin. And we know how, the world, how horrible the world is. We know how hard it is to live here. You know, there's sickness, there's dying, there's you're struggling with finances, you're increasing responsibilities and you're diminishing means or ability. It's, oh, it's, oh, save me. And so we hear there's a gospel by the man who came from heaven, was crucified and was raised from the dead. Well, thank God. And what did he tell us? What did he say? He said, in the world, <laughs> you shall have tribulation. Thank you. Thank you very much. But then he says, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And he did. But just having him say that, it's like, okay, watch me do it. And he's raised from the dead. It's like, oh, how nice for him. I'm still here.
the good news is on the other side of the veil. It's not found in this world. Victory is in Jesus at the right hand of God. Happiness happens occasionally. It's happenstance. It's something that happens. It's not the constant state. Nobody can live on sugar only. Yeah, happiness is wonderful when it happens. Everybody feels good on vacation. Everybody can have a nice day and feel good. What do you do when you're having a lousy day? Do you surrender? No, you've got to fight back. Happiness happens occasionally. But the rest is death and dying, stealing, killing, and destroying. Everyone is palliated, drunk, distracted, infatuated, or sated by the God of this world, worshiping fallen angels and fake religions. There, I said it. Paul says in Colossians 3, 1 through 3, If you all be risen with Christ, since you all have been risen with Christ, are we in agreement? Seek those things which are above. You've been raised to newness of life, not to go back into the world and feed off of the world, to seek those things which are above. Where Christ sits, at the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Now, I'm going to get to the title of my message, which is Rightly Dividing Your Own Thoughts. Paul says in Romans 7, 13, but I see another law in my members, in my body, warring against the law of my mind. Battle is in the mind. And bringing me into captivity to the law of sin and death, which is in my flesh. Paul is observing that. He's not advocating or saying that that's Oh, that's the way it is. See you later. No. Because in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3 through 5, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We're seeking things above, but there's something in the way. We need to pull those things down, these strongholds that come from doctrines of devils, lack of knowing the scriptures, distractions, sin. Weapons are of our warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That word imaginations is anything that you conjure up in your own thought life that is contrary to, the God, to God's truth, to the reality of who he is. So we have weapons of our warfare give us the ability to cast down imaginations and every high thing that would exalt itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Do you know the difference? Paul is just telling us to do this. Casting down 
imaginations that would exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. Well, how do you know what is exalting itself against the knowledge of God? What is, how can you discern what thoughts or what's going on in a spirit around you that's against, hostile to, contrary to the knowledge of God? We have God's Word. It's very important. The Word isn't a conscious entity in the, in, the, in the pages of the book. It's a record of the things that God said, His ordered Word, His righteousness, His holiness, His presence. So the Alpha and Omega, it's all there in His Word. And when you read it, all that ordering of God goes into your mind. It gets renewed. You're familiar with it. You begin to think like that instead of thinking like the stinking world. And then you know how he rolls. And you're grooving on that. Something comes up trying to go this way. You go, no, 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 no. You know the difference. You can tell the difference. You can divide between the holy and the profane. You can divide between the thing that would exalt itself against the knowledge of God. Satan's trying to exalt himself. I will exalt my throne above the stars. I'll be like the most high God. If you know the difference, you know that you're with God. You're above. You have authority above those voices. And you don't take the bait. You need to discern what is of God, what is not. Paul says, I'm persuaded, in Romans 8, 39, I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities, first time reading that, and, uh, and Paul saying that he's persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels or principalities, or powers, or things present, or things to come, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Why do you stick angels in there? Angels are the good guys, right? Not so fast. Paul's persuaded that neither death, bad, nor life, things in this world, nor angels, nor principalities, a prince and a principality, a prince is a ruler of something, and a principality is what he rules over. They're not all friendly. Nor powers, same thing, nor things present, nor things in the future. Don't worry about the future, folks. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, okay, so even though I'm, I'm being eaten alive by the devil, God still loves me. No, that's not the conclusion to draw from that. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Well, what is the love of God? The love of God is the salvation of God. The love of God is his son. The love of God is the power of God. The love of God is what saved you to deliver you out of darkness and bring you into the, into the the light into the kingdom of his dear son, keep you, surround you, protect you, keep you forever, eternally secure in him and with him forever. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. You get it? It's such a great salvation. We have such a great God. Okay, 2 Timothy, chapter 2, 11 through 15. Paul says, it's a faithful saying, or faithful is the saying. And then he goes on, and what I'm about to read is a creed. A creed is the equivalent, it's like a first century equivalent of a meme. Or a nursery rhyme. Or a billboard, or a bumper sticker. A pithy slogan, pithy slogan, pithy slogan would be a nice, uh, you know, I think of Pippi Longstockings and pithy slogan. It sounds like they're kind of children's characters of a children's book. A creed was something that would be memorized, 
often that would rhyme, often it would be recited with a, a, a melody and a rhythm to it. No books, no printing presses back then. So they could take the gospel and distill it down to some pithy phrases that could be memorized like we all know, row, row, row your boat. It's things like that. The interesting thing about these creeds, why I find them so fascinating, is they're the oldest things we have in the New Testament. They predate the authors because the authors are quoting these creeds and they were only more recently being discovered in the, uh, in the scriptures because as the more we learn about the original languages, we know that certain languages are the way that they're treated in the original autographs, the original texts, we can see that there is a, a rhyme to it in the, in the Greek, in the original language. There's, there, there's a rhyme, there's a pattern to it, and we, we, these are the, um, the poetry of the Bible. So they can tell by the structure of it and how it was inserted in there, hey, that's not part of the flow of what the writer was saying. He's quoting a little thing that everybody knows, like I did in the beginning when I said, it's a beautiful morning, the rascal song. It brings us all, it takes us into the musical space part of your head. So this creed, um, 2 Timothy, where Paul says, faithful is a saying, or it is a faithful saying. Um, For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer or endure we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Paul goes on, of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit or that profit nothing but to the subverting or the catastrophe of the hearers. These would be um, strive not about words to no or to nothing, but only end up subverting or being a catastrophe to the hearers. But, verse 15, King James says study, but the word is be diligent to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needs not to be ashamed Rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Nate gave me a plaque that Jim had on his desk with that verse on it. Study to show thyself approved. You know, when I became a pastor, a workman who needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Um, I was no stranger to the concept of right division Uh, and the more that I applied it, the more I realized that there is two approaches you can take to it. One is what is taught mostly from the pulpit or in seminaries is what belongs in this column, what belongs in that column. What applies to to Israel, what applies to the church. And you study and you can answer all the questions on the on the test, and you can get it right. You can get it right, okay? And your mind cannot, you cannot rightly divide your own thoughts. And therefore, your heart is confused. Because they're pumping out graduates in these seminaries who are teaching salvation from the Gospels. And, oh, Paul is hard to be understood. I was reading some article the other day and it was like uh, a polemic against Paul. We should be reading Jesus, not Paul. And I go, right division is not simply assessing right from wrong. Although that would be an obvious one. Um, But that's basically what the law does. The law divides between the holy and the profane, between the things of heaven, the way God would order things, and 
the way things go on the, on the earth with the things that are unclean, that are profane. The law points those out. But what is the law doing in the process of pointing those things out? Right division, broadly applied, ought not be prejudicial. Prejudicial is if you approach the either dispensationalism or the right division, if you approach it on this good, that bad, you've just closed the door on a lot of the revelation of God that's in the scriptures. You can write you need to right divide, rightly divide your thoughts on how we approach these things. I'll give you an example. One of my favorite ones is Psalm 19, starting from verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect. <clears throat> Grace people. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Well, how does the law convert your soul? Well, when you read the Ten Commandments, you became aware, in no uncertain terms, that you were incapable of obeying it. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul, alerting the soul, causing you to repent, to turn. That's the beginning. It's where it all starts, realizing, acknowledging that you're a sinner. The testimony of the Lord is sure making wise the simple. The statutes, law, the statutes of the Lord are right. God's holiness is right. His absolute holiness is absolutely right. He's not wrong. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. You ought to look at the law and realize, and that should rejoice your heart, that our God is that holy and unapproachable outside of Christ. That intolerant of sin, yet that merciful to give us time to repent and a means of salvation. The commandment of the Lord is pure. Enlightening the eyes. It'll give you keen vision about discerning and rightly dividing. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Any argument with that? More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb and the honey on the slate Bible study. By the way, I got the honey on the slate. For those of you who don't know, our Bible study and midweek Bible study is honey on the slate. It's because rabbis, when they would teach children and they would use a slate to write on it, they would introduce the children to, the, to the, their, their schooling by putting a drop of honey on their slate. So they would associate learning the word with sweetness. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned. We want to be warned. Like a lighthouse, travel ahead. You're going the wrong way. And in keeping of them, in protecting and guarding them, there is great reward. Matthew 5, 17, Jesus says, Think not that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till it be fulfilled. Well, what's, what does it mean to fulfill the law? What is the absolute requirement of the law? It's perfection or death. Is there a third? 
No. The wages of sin is death. Well, there was a death. The ultimate death. God himself as our substitute died in our place. Fulfilling the law. The ultimate fulfillment. Death. Death couldn't hold him. He opened the way to heaven for all who believe. The fulfillment of the law is glorious. Glorious. What is glory? It's God's manifested radiating presence. It's the light of God, the glory of God, the truth of God, the perfection of God radiating out from the throne room 360 degrees in every direction all throughout the entire universe forever. That's glorious. That's glory. That's what Christ is. He's brought us into that unapproachable light in Christ. That's where we sit. That's where we are. That's where we operate from, folks. Discerning right division means to differentiate conflicting gospels. Conflicting gospels? Yeah. How can there be conflict in God's inspired word? Well, that has to do with what did they know and when did they know it? The whole scriptures, the whole, you know, from Genesis to Revelation. What did they know, whoever he was talking to, and when did they know it? Or what was revealed and what was concealed? God was re revealing plenty about himself to Moses and the Jews. Plenty! Most of our Bible is the Old Testament. There's plenty revealed. But the most glorious was concealed. The mystery was concealed. Until the prophet that nobody saw coming had a one-on-one -on -one with Jesus on the road to Damascus. And the mystery was revealed to Paul. The mystery of the church, the mystery of Christ in you, the hope of glory, the mystery of the Jew and the Gentile, all being saved by the same means. God cannot fully reveal himself to mortal, sinful man. Sin and God's intimate, glorious, holy presence are mutually exclusive. Thus, God telegraphed his word to men. Hebrews 11, excuse me, Hebrews 1, verse 1 and 2. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds. In these last days he's spoken to us by his Son. No more prophets. What was the last word that his son gave to anybody on earth? It was to Paul, the prophet nobody saw coming, to whom the mystery was, was revealed. The final word. In this manner, God periodically manifested his word to his people on the earth for millennia. This method served as God's authoritative presence in the fallen world from the Garden of Eden until approximately 430 B.C. with the last prophecy, Malachi, the last prophet. 400 and some years of silence before John the Baptist, the next prophet. So you've got this gospel of Paul and this gospel of Jesus and there's some, there's, there's some conflict here. We need to apply this concept of discerning what is in keeping with God's revelation of the moment for us 
not to the Jews, what is current for us, what came through Paul, understanding God that way and ordering everything in, to be in alignment with what he showed Paul about the mystery. Now think about how we learn about salvation. When we first learn about the man who was raised from the dead, born of a virgin, raised from the dead, the gospel, the hope of, of, of eternal life. What most evangelical churches teach is salvation. Here's salvation according to Jesus, the Jesus we love. Remember, God says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so, based upon that, Billy Graham and these guys will have a rally and they'll say, do you believe? Are you ready to believe? Are you ready to accept Jesus into your heart? And everybody comes up and they say, yes, I believe I believe that he died, that God raised him from the, the, from the dead, and I believe that. Well, that's nice, um, but do you want to explain that to me? How that affects you? I can see how it affected Jesus. Great day, fantastic. But you're, I'm, still, I'm still in the guilt of my sins. I don't quite understand the connection here. They don't ask the question. Somebody theorize that since the John's gospel was written very late that it could be that he had read some of Paul's letters and justification by faith shows up in that John 3:16 that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life without explaining it but it shows up there I don't know if that's how it happened or not but according to Jesus the path to everlasting life is more complicated than that or more complex Jesus himself stipulates um, the following conditions. Let's see. Um, one of the things he says is you need to do the will of God. Matthew seven twenty one. Not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Okay. I have no problem with that, right? I mean, who could object to doing God's will, right? We want to do God's will. Okay, that shouldn't be too hard. Um, Jesus does not say, I'll be crucified soon and be resurrected three days later. Uh, This you'll have to believe if you're to enter the kingdom of heaven. But he does say to obey the law. Luke 10, 25 through 37, a lawyer specifically asks, what is necessary for eternal life? Let's read that. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, what is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered, saying, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind with all, and love thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, thou hast answered right. This do and thou shalt live. Okay, that wasn't exactly the whole law. But when you cite from the law, you're not cherry picking it, especially if you're a lawyer or a Pharisee, you know, talking to Jesus. You say, I know enough of it. You can say 10 commandments. Well, that's basically, if you're going to live that way, it's all 613 of them, the law. Hmm. So Jesus goes on, uh, Matthew, and it emphasizes that adherence to all the laws is what's required to be called to the kingdom of heaven. Think not that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy but to fulfill. Yes. But does he reveal it? Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot nor one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever, therefore, shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Oh, brother, this is getting complicated. Um, 
For I say to you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. Oh, we're screwed. This time a ruler asks, what shall I do for eternal life? And he gets the same answer plus a whole lot more. And a certain ruler asked him saying, good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Thou knows the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor thy mother and father. And he said, all these I have kept from my youth. Okay, hotshot. One thing, sell all that you have, distribute it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. This is what, this is the gospel according to Jesus. I'm not trying to, I'm not, I'm trying to contextualize this. He's a Jew talking to Jews about the prescription for holiness, which is to obey the law perfectly. Oh, believe the gospel and be baptized. He's adding on. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel unto the whole creation. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that disbelieveth shall be condemned. Do good works. Anybody got a problem with doing good works? No, we should all desire to do good. Eschew evil and do good. Inarguable. Matthew 15, 45 and 46, um, parable of the sheep on the right hand, the goats on the left. Uh, then he answered them saying, Verily I say unto you, and as much as you did it not to the least of these, you did it to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto life eternal. There could be no question that Jesus taught that works were a pre prerequisite to life eternal. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Matthew 16, 27. Tend to the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the unclothed, the sick, the imprisoned, He says, for those that do not, that they shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto life eternal. There is a never-ending need to feed and clothe the poor and the hungry. There's an increasing number all the time. Is there anything wrong with doing any of that? No. But you all know the one who does it out of great personal sacrifice. He wants to be sure that you know it. And he wants to get the right photo opportunity. Oh, here's one. Forsake your wife and children. And everyone that has forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit eternal, everlasting life. Oh, he can't possibly mean that. Oh, that's what he said. This is what they teach in 90-some percent of the churches. I mean, they're not, they're not going to whip this one out, but they're teaching salvation is found in Matthew and Mark. They call it the synoptic gospels as if there's some harmony between those three and John. No, re each one is unique in its presentation of what it's talking about there. But point is, you're not going to find anything about being identified on that cross with Christ in there at all. Christ resurrected. You, well, what it do for us? Where am I? Got it, sundry times, divers madness. Okay. Oh, I got Here's a little one for you. See, I told you it was little. Um, I learned this this week. And 
it's a little tip about a little kind of mini but important right division of understanding some things about the scriptures. And this is about the King James Version of the Bible. I, am, I, I use the authorized King James Version, Bollinger's. And I think you've heard me say that my, the reason I favor that is because it sounds like God's Word as opposed to modern translations that just sound like Fred said it, you know, just like regular speech. Now, I realize uh, somebody asked Michael Heiser um, which translation um, people should read. You know, he's a Hebrew scholar. He was, you know, he did all the, the scholarship and residence for Logos Bible Software, and, of course, he wrote The Unseen Realm, and, and he was a highly regarded Scholar, really accredited scholar. Everything he ever wrote was peer-reviewed. He was totally the real deal. And so when asked about what translation he would recommend, he says, whatever you will read, whatever one you will read, it's like, get the book open, just start. And he's right. But there is something unique about the King James Version compared to modern translations, because there's, there's kind of, the modern translations are somehow... It's like, no, the these, the thous, the thems is tripping people up, so we're going to broom it of that stuff, and we're going to use modern, conventional, contemporary lingo so people will be able to relate to it. Huh? That's cool, yeah. <laughs> but listen to this. Now, don't worry about taking notes, because I printed a bunch of these, so everybody gets one. This is a door prize. Everybody gets one. Reach out of your seat. There'll be a new Pontiac... Um, listen to this, though, seriously. Um, in the King James Version, all second-person pronouns, don't let your eyes glaze over, all second-person pronouns beginning with the letter T are singular. All second-person pronouns beginning with the letter Y are plural. The, thou, thy, and thine begin with a T, and they're always singular. Always. Ye, you, your, and yours are always plural. Always. When Paul says thou, and he says ye, he's, ye is talking to you all, all you Jews. Thou, ye. Hebrew and Greek also distinguish between the two, but only the King James Version distinguishes the precise pronouns of the Hebrew and the Greek. Who knew? Maybe you did. Maybe you said, yeah, no, I didn't know that. So hit me up if you want to put one of these in your Bible. I think it would be a good thing to tape inside the cover of your Bible because you will forget. And then you, this will remind you, and then you'll read about um, ye must be born again. Um, and you'll see, it's not just, it was you Jews must be born again. Just saying. Um, okay, so. How do we rightly divide our own thoughts? Because that's, that's the message I'm trying to help, help us with. Because it's one thing to have the Sunday school answers. It's another thing to have it be on the spiritual autopilot inside that you know that you know that you know. Instead of, oh, I passed the test. Could you pass the test again? I don't know. I don't think I could pass the Constitution test again. Well, you had to in 8th grade or 7th grade or whatever. But I want you to know that you know that you know these things so that your mind is renewed and your discernment, you can see the things that differ because you're so acquainted with God's holiness and who you are in Christ that these other previous Gospels that don't quite get there, that you can say, okay, I could see what they were getting at, but we've got this. We've got the end result, the, the telos. We've received the end of our salvation. We're seated with him in the heavens. That's where you operate from. That's the air you breathe. That's the words you speak. That's the life you live is what's emanating from the throne of God. 1 Peter 5, 6 through 10. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God.
That was hard to do when I was, when I was a young Christian or before I was a Christian. Even the very thought of that is humbling myself before God. But we all got there, didn't we? We all got there the same way. Like, you know, Jacob, you wrestled with God for decades. It was a little, as a young boy. I didn't know much about the Bible, but I did know if I wanted to be a missionary, if I wanted to do good, if I wanted to serve God, I had to sell all my stuff and go to Africa and be a missionary. I'm going, I like my stuff. I seriously wrestled with that in my, you know, early teens. But humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Pride comes before a fall. You think you're something special, you're not. He's the only thing that's special, the only one that's special. Lucifer is the one who wanted, I will exalt my throne above the stars. I'll be like the Most High God. That's pride. That's the flesh. That's the God of this world. That's Hollywood. It's all the I, me, mine. Look at me. Aren't I special? It's all the puffy lips and the posing and all that crap. It's all ego. It's all self. No, humble yourself. You want to be great in God's kingdom? Learn to be servant of all. Humble yourself. Christ humbled himself, became a human, became an earth man, humus, dirt, earth, God, a dirt man. Well, he did. He, did. he was a celestial being, whatever the, uh, the Elohim, the spirit. He's the uh, species unique. No one like him. You know, the, the Bible in a lot of, because, you know, I talk a lot about these other Elohim, the other angels, the ones that fell. You know, people think, how can an angel fall? They don't have free will. Yes, they do have free will. How could Lucifer have fallen if he didn't? He says, you know what? Looks, I think I, I'm gonna, he could. What's God going to do? Seriously, what was God going to do? He throws him out. He's repelled. God didn't even have to do anything. God just watched it happen. Lucifer decided he's going to exalt himself. And God says to the son, watch this. Boom. Lucifer's gone. Just that fast, the bug zap, zap, he's gone. And a bunch of angels, you know, we're deceived, weren't with him. You know, it's not just a mess on the earth. It's just this one's confined. He's, at least he's got the, you know, Satan down here instead of the whole universe getting all messed up the way I read it. So God had to fix that, and he's got it down here for the trial and the conviction and the, the lake, the fire, to finally eradicate the evil from the universe. That was not a humbling thing. It will be a humbling thing for Satan when people look at him and say, this is the one that deceived the nations? The worm? But God humbled himself. And then he was highly exalted. My God, my God. A sign of, of being elevated, exalted, like we heard last week. Saul, Saul, elevated. Humble yourselves that he may exalt you in due time. Lucifer does the exact opposite. He pridefully exalts himself, and then God will humble him all the way down. Pride comes before a fall. But when you humble yourself before God, he may, that he may exalt you. He wants to exalt you. He wants to elevate you. He wants you up with him. He wants you on the divine councils to replace the angels that fell forever. With his spirit, never to fall again. Humble yourselves, therefore, in the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care on him. All the stuff we worry about in this world, cast that on him. He overcame hell, death, and the grave for you. He can certainly take care of the, whatever pimple is bothering you. He cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because the devil, your adversary, as a roaming lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. This ain't heaven, folks. The Garden of Eden had a wall around it. Heaven 
has a wall around it. The, 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 the Ark of the Covenant was walled. Because there's darkness, there's chaos out there. The devil is out there. And as long as he's out there, we need to be vigilant because he's seeking whom he may devour. This is not heaven. Heaven's real. This ain't it. Be a watchman on the wall. It doesn't mean worrying or threatening or expecting things bad, but be diligent. Because he's trying to distract you. He's trying to get you off the wall. He says, referring to the devil, he says, whom resist steadfast in the faith. In the faith, you are steadfast because it's the faith of Christ. Knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of grace, who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a little while, he'll make you perfect and establish and strengthen you and settle you. Well, glory to God. I opened with all those beautiful songs. I'm going to review them really quickly because we're going to we're come to a close pretty quickly here. The songs that I talked about was uh, the 59th Street Bridge song, Slow Down, You're Moving Too Fast, Feeling Groovy. Um, it's a beautiful morning. I think I'll go outside for a while and just smile the rascals. I got a peaceful, easy feeling. You won't let me down, the eagles. And oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. Gordon McRae from Oklahoma. Now, Philippians 4, 6 through 8. Paul says, be careful for nothing. That doesn't mean to be reckless. It means don't take on worry about anything. Don't worry about anything. How many of you are worry warts? Put that in the rearview mirror. In Christ, there is nothing to worry about. Be careful for nothing, but here's the prescription. By everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests, allow your requests, let go from them, burdening your heart, release them to God, make it known to him. Expose the problems that you are dealing with here to God in your prayers with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. We talk about prayer all the time. When you do this, the peace of God that passes understanding, the peace of God that's tangible, the peace of God that you've been longing and yearning for, it's the thing that is the opposite of the stress and the worry and the fears that plague your life, peace of God that's beyond your ability to understand it. How can this be? Shall keep, shall guard, shall protect your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You can't have worry and the peace of God in the same heart at the same time. Let not your heart be troubled. If your heart is troubled, if you're afraid, or when you get afraid or when you get troubled, because that happens to all of us. Let your request be made known unto God. Whatever the thing that was bothering you, whatever Satan used to put you under the law about this, that, you jump too high, it didn't jump high enough. Whatever that is, make that known to God and the peace of God that passes understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Well, I could say amen right there. Amen. But I'm not going to because there's more. And here's the more, which we forget. It's the Joel McRae. It's the Paul Simon feeling groovy. It's the, it's a beautiful morning. Paul says, the Apostle Paul, not Paul Simon or not Paul McCartney, although they wouldn't disagree. Paul says, after you've cast your care on the Lord, you've received that peace that passes all understanding, this is what we're to do. Finally, Brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, 
Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, this is the things that I was raised in from my mom about life is beautiful. Look at the beautiful stuff. And then all hell broke loose for 20 years till I found Jesus. And now I've cast my care on him. I've pulled down imaginations. I've let my requests be made known unto God. I'm watching on the wall. We're not ignorant of, the, of devil's devices. But Paul says, and if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. That's the end of the gospel. The conclusion of the gospel is not to be in a continuous battle against spiritual forces. It's to be in a beautiful place. Everything's beautiful and nothing hurts in Christ. It's a beautiful ending. That's our eternal life with Christ. I can't do any better than that for you folks. Thank you, Dave. Glory to God. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being so attentive. Thank you for receiving it so much. It's so rewarding to be able to share these words with you folks. You don't know how blessed I am to be able to teach you things that God shows me during the week. So thank you for being here. I pray that you take these words with you and that it'll change your life. And it'll change the lives of those that you love. So I got your door prize. Come and see me. I'll give you a copy. Thank you. <laughs>